please, please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, Dr. Alan Hirschfeld, Professor of Physics, UMass Dartmouth, and Director of the UMass Dartmouth Observatory. He's also an associate of the Harvard College Observatory. Dr. Hirschfeld received his undergraduate degree in astrophysics from Princeton University in 1973 and his PhD in astronomy from Yale in 1978. And in that year, he began teaching physics and astronomy at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, which he has continued to the present day. In addition to doing teaching and research, Dr. Hirschfeld has been a prolific author. His first volume was Sky Catalog 2000, which he co-authored co -authored with Roger Sinha in 1982. He has published six books, I believe I counted right, six books since then. And today we are gonna talk about two of these. In 2014, Dr. Hirschfeld authored Starlight Detectives, how astronomers and inventors and eccentrics discovered the modern universe. Today, Dr. Hirschfeld is going to describe, and I quote, the decades long bridge of innovation that transformed Victorian era visual astronomy into the scientific discipline that is observational astrophysics. It was a process to which George Ellery Hale was deeply committed and a process that drove the construction of his three great observatories, Yerkes, Mount Wilson, and Palomar. We'll have time for questions after Dr. Hirschfeld's presentation. And I'd also like to reserve some time for a discussion of his most recent book, Introduction to Stars and Planets, an activities-based approach. Through a series of exercises, the reader practices and learns about the methods used by professional astronomers. Well, that's a lot to get in in one, in one meeting. So we'll have questions at the end. If you can mute, mute your microphones for now. With that, Dr. Hirschfeld, welcome. Thank you. And I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Steve. Um, so I would like to share my screen. Am I able to do that? Uh, I, I hope so. Should be. You, yes. might, you might have to make me co-host. Let me see. <clears throat> I can see your screen. Oh, good. Okay. Very good. Okay, yeah, so um, the, the theme of what I would like to talk about today comes from uh, this book that Steve had mentioned, Starlight Detectives. Um, taking it back a little bit further in my own history, around the year 2000, uh, having been a college teacher for many, many years by that time, I decided to take a year off <clears throat> to write a book uh, and that first book was the book called Parallax, which was about how astronomers measured the first distance to a star outside the solar system. And looking back on that book, uh, which I just enjoyed tr writing tremendously because of all that I learned about the history of astronomy, 
that, that book was really a history of visual astronomy, specifically high precision visual astronomy, as it turns out. And if you're at all familiar with that book, uh, the, the story sort of ends around the 1840s or so. <clears throat> having finished that book <clears throat> and having seen what could be done just by eye at the, the telescope, uh, I contrasted that with modern day <clears throat> astronomy and astrophysics and the instrumentation that we have today and the capabilities that we have. It, it's a challenge for me as a teacher to keep up with all of the discoveries that are being made by this high tech equipment all over the world. And so I wondered how did astronomy transform from and almost, well, basically exclusively visual art science into a very highly modernized apparatus supported science. <clears throat> and so it turns out that just about the time that the parallax story comes to an end in the 1840s, a new story begins about the modernization of astronomy, the creation of what became known as astrophysics. And <clears throat> that's what this book is all about. It's the story of the many, many dozens of people, astronomers, inventors, eccentrics, as the subtitle says, who turned astronomy from a visual science into a modern science. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about one of those many, many people who contributed to this great advancement. You just see several of them here. There are many times more who are mentioned <clears throat> in the book. And uh, again, I personally found the research and writing of this story to be just fascinating because of the, the history. <clears throat> and one thing that became clear in these decades from 1840s to like 1920s, amateur astronomers were critical in the advancement of astronomy. <clears throat> right, so you, you may or may not recognize some of the, the pictures here. Uh, you, you can ask me later if, if you want. <clears throat> So here we see astronomy in the 1840s. <clears throat> Many of you will recognize the picture at the upper left there. <clears throat> okay, that is the so-called Leviathan of Parsons Town, the biggest telescope in the world as of the 1840s. You can see uh, a person up there at the Newtonian focus. So you had to be way up above that dark pit at night to even look into this telescope. It was a reflector telescope, six feet across, <clears throat> a solid metal mirror that was <clears throat> polished to, re to reflect light. <clears throat> the typical instrument of the day was however, much, much smaller. As you see in the lower left, <clears throat> there were many, many refractor telescopes around, lens-based telescopes. <clears throat> so the lower left represents more the style than the upper left. However, both of them had in common in the 1840s that they were used exclusively by eye. Somebody's eye was up at the eyepiece. <clears throat> and one thing that was discovered by Lord Ross, who was the builder and owner of the big <clears throat> Leviathan telescope, is the spiral nebula, which he drew there on the right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, couldn't take a picture because there were no cameras that were available for his telescope. As we'll see, photography just came on the scene at about this time. So that's a hand drawing. And that's what astronomers did if they wanted to show somebody else 
who was not there at the telescope with them, what they saw last night or last year. They'd have to draw it or they'd have to hire an artist to draw it. <clears throat> so as you can see, Lord Ross was um, fairly good at uh, sketching what he saw. You might recognize that. You might recognize it again here. That's the same object. But now we are in the 1920s. We leaped out of the 1840s, fast forwarded to the 1920s. We're absolutely by my definition into what we would recognize as modern astronomy, modern astronomical observing. What's different? <clears throat> well, three things are different from the 1840s. The eye is rarely used in research in the 1920s, supplanted by the camera. <clears throat> So you see here a photograph of this object that Lord Ross saw. It's uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy, Messier 51. <clears throat> that was taken through the 100 inch Hooker telescope that you see there on the left. So photography has come of age in a sense uh, by the 1920s. And also below it, we see the spectrum. <clears throat> of, uh, well, I'm not sure if that's a star or a galaxy, but it is a spectrum of a celestial object. And you can see there are some spectral lines in there. And I see that it is uh, not a star, that is the spectrum of a galaxy. <clears throat> uh, so the world, the universe was really opened up to physical exploration and chemical exploration by the spectroscope, spectrograph. And sometimes often the camera was coupled with the spectrograph. You take a picture of the spectrum of a star or a galaxy and interpret it. And the third leg of this modernization I already mentioned, it is the creation of large high precision telescopes. Okay, the Leviathan of Parsonstown from the 1840s was no doubt a large telescope, but nobody would have characterized it as a high precision telescope. And <clears throat> I would say that the 100 inch telescope on Mount Wilson is truly, well, not quite the first, but certainly the, the biggest of those first high precision reflector large telescopes. <clears throat> By 1888, the famous astronomy historian, writer Agnes Clerk wrote about the influence of the camera in astronomy. The camera is an encroaching instrument. So surely as it gains a foothold, in any field of research, so surely it advances to occupy the whole, either as adjunct or principal. So by 1888, astronomers, professional astronomers were starting to recognize the potential of photography, as well as the potential of spectroscopy talked to them a couple of decades before that, and they wanted nothing to do with photography or spectroscopy. These fields were, these instruments were just too crude. And that's where the amateur astronomers came in, <clears throat> in this transformation of astronomy into a modern science. There were a whole number of amateur astronomers who built their own telescopes, some of which were quite large. They attached cameras to them, and in some cases, spectroscopes to them, uh, until the point around 1890s or so when the professional astronomers recognized what these amateurs had discovered and then uh, took on this high-tech equipment. So rather than go through all of these contributors that are mentioned in the book that I wrote, uh, I'm just gonna talk about one 
amateur astronomer and his contribution to the advancement of astronomy in the late 1800s. <clears throat> so there you see a telescope recognizable as such. Some of you might even recognize the telescope, but I suspect um, most people have not seen this thing before. And yet it is a critical telescope in the whole history of the modernization of astronomy. So the title of the talk, From Backyard to Mountaintop, The Adventures of History's Best Worst Telescope. <clears throat> and here's the individual that I'd like to start off with. This is Andrew Ainsley Common from London, a professional sanitation engineer, also an amateur astronomer from childhood. He, from age 10, he had borrowed somebody's telescope and was just hooked. But as people still do, they had to earn a living. And so he set aside the astronomy, became an engineer and built a very successful company and career in sanitation engineering. So when he decided to put aside his sanitation engineering career and truly pursue this passion of astronomy, he went to the catalogs of telescopes, uh, and one of which was by George Calver, a very well-known telescope maker at the time. You can see there he created quite a number of mirrors and had, uh, was very successful in producing uh, complete telescopes like you see here, which, well, again, recognizably a Newtonian telescope on a really, really hefty, hefty mount. Now, this view, is a picture from 1910, it's as far back as I could go, that shows the street on which Andrew Common, the amateur astronomer, lived. And you can tell that it is a fairly well-to-do suburb of London. The houses, even though they're hidden by trees, you can see they're, they're fairly large. Um, <clears throat> Not surprisingly, London is not the best place to do astronomy by eye or by camera because of all the fogs and uh, lack of clarity of the sky, the pollution and such, but that's where Andrew Common lived. So he bought a telescope from Calver and he installed it into a garden shed, a converted garden shed in his backyard. I'm not going to show you the complete backyard yet. You'll see it shortly. <clears throat> so here we see a sliding roof off of this brick structure, very Victorian looking. Uh, you can, can absolutely see the, the telescope, an 18-incher uh, <clears throat> that uh, is pointed here through the opening. I'm looking inside, I see what looks to be a pile of garbage. I have no idea what that's all about, but it's such a, a, a weird Victorian setting with ivy climbing the walls and even a garden shovel and some walkway here. Let's pull back a little bit now and look at the larger scale photo. Okay, there you see the 18 inch telescope. Well, what, what's the first thing that any amateur astronomer says after looking through their new telescope? I need a bigger telescope. And that is, I assume what Common said because very soon, he went back to Calver and said, make me a 37 inch. 
telescope, reflector telescope. And that is what's seen in the background there. So you can make out this shed. It has a roll off roof. What is hard to see is that the entire structure is on like some tracks so that the an entire shed can shift around as uh, common moves the telescope to different parts of the night sky. And that is him there again at the Newtonian eyepiece. <clears throat> I can only imagine having looked at the picture of that street that he lived on, what his neighbors must have thought when they looked over the fence and saw this. So this is a view I've determined looking east. So I just want to call your attention to, okay, there's a field, a farm field in the background. There seems to be a row of trees. Looks like there may be a, a path or road back there. Because I went to uh, Google Maps, typed in his address. Andrew Common from 1879 or so, 63 Eaton Rise in Ealing. And this is what came up. So uh, I, I think the orange rectangle there represents where Common's house and yard used to be. And the arrow I think is pointing in the direction from which that previous photograph of his backyard was taken, probably from a second story window or so. <clears throat> and it's possible maybe this road here with, again, a line of trees, maybe, maybe that is that road that was uh, off in the distance in, in the previous picture. So what is there at 63 Eaton Rise? Now, the Andrew Common Museum. Nope. Bus stop. Talk about layers of history. Uh, how many people have walked by or stood under this thing completely unaware of the historical nature of this site? So what did Andrew Common bring to astronomy? Well, this, okay, so this is the larger of his two telescopes. This is the telescope that was pictured toward the back fence of his backyard. This is the 37 inch reflector telescope. <clears throat> and you can see it, it is rather, it has a rather unusual design. Nobody really knew what the best design was back in 1879. So uh, Andrew Common came up with this mount himself. Calver made the mirror. <clears throat> what are some of the essential aspects of this instrument? Okay, well, first, uh, here's the mirror. You can see the edge of the mirror, 37 inches, as I said, glass, with a silver coating. Okay, so they were using glass now, not uh, no longer speculum metal mirrors. So much, much lighter weight than a solid metal mirror would have been. So that's, that's fairly modern. <clears throat> and if you look here, okay, this it represents the end of the declination axis. Okay, this is the polar axis. So the mirror, strangely, which would be the heaviest part of the telescope, is forward of the axes, the mount itself, which is a rather strange way of doing it because it makes the telescope top heavy. Because you have the rest of the tube and whatever is up here with the eyepiece. <clears throat> Uh, therefore, oh, why did he do this? Common was convinced that there would be air currents around the various 
metal structures that might have been used to support this tube arrangement. So he put the mirror ahead of this axis and instead had to, by the laws of physics, have a place to put some counterweights so that the telescope tube was balanced in declination. And the, the counterweights were placed in a box that you see there, typically about 10 times whatever the weight that was sitting up here, the eyepiece, or we'll see some other equipment in a moment. So it, it was a very awkward to use telescope. It did, however, have some innovations in heavy air quotes. Uh, <clears throat> Andrew Common decided that he would place the polar axis axle in a cylinder containing mercury on the theory that the mercury would buoy up this cylinder and it would basically float friction free. Well, a professional astronomer later assessed this whole idea as a delusion. It absolutely did not work as it intended. It did, however, have a gravity-driven descending weight clock drive. So it could, in theory at least, track celestial objects as they moved across the sky. The reality, of course, was somewhat uh, less optimistic. And just to throw this whole thing into doubt, the whole weight of it was nine tons. So if you're talking about a large precision telescope, no doubt this was large by the standards of the day. Precision, eh, not quite so. Here is a picture of the upper end, the eyepiece end of the tube. So you can see it was mostly an open tube, except there was some steel plating here. This is where the eyepiece normally would have sat. And what is there in place of the eyepiece is the apparatus that would represent Andrew Common's major contribution to the modernization of astronomy. It's a plate holder, it's a camera, and it has an illuminated crosshair guiding eyepiece. It's up at the Newtonian focus, which as we'll see is problematic. It took pictures on glass plates about three inches by four inches and uh, for those of you who are familiar with the term image stacking from CCD photography, this was sort of a Victorian era image stacking uh, technique that had to be used. This arrow points to a little cylindrical guiding eyepiece. So when Andrew Common wanted to take a photograph of a celestial object, he would guide his telescope put the celestial object into the field of view. He would look into this guiding eyepiece, find a nearby star that he could place within those, the intersection of those crosshairs, and then turn these knurled knobs, you can see here's one, here's another, to actually move the photographic plate so that the star, the target guide star would remain stationary and you wouldn't get a blurry photograph. So that would suffice for a few minutes worth of guiding, but he would reach the end of the travel of these various knurled knobs and he would then close up the plate shutter physically move the telescope, okay, which again, it had a clock drive, but it was totally insufficient for time exposure photography. 
he'd physically move the telescope to again realign the guide star in the guiding eyepiece on those crosshairs. Okay, uh, turn back these knurled knobs to the middle or end of their travel and open up the shutter. And he would do this multiple times for, well, could be you know, like up to an hour. Okay, so this is what I mean by image stacking. He would expose and cover up, move the scope, expose again, covered up, move the scope. And in this way, manage to take a rather low precision instrument and turn it into quite a groundbreaking instrument. <clears throat> This is what I mean by groundbreaking. So this is his 1883 photograph, a 60 minute exposure, not all at once, as I mentioned, of the Orion Nebula. And this, this was stunning. When he showed this at the Royal Astronomical Society and people couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was so exquisitely detailed compared to any other photograph, any other drawing of the Orion Nebula. And this from the suburbs of London. So just to show you what this photograph of 1883 was being compared to, in the upper left we have a drawing by an astronomical artist uh, Etienne Trouvelot, who worked at Harvard. And this is his sketch of the Orion Nebula from 1876. And if you look closely at it, uh, I mean, if you had a picture that you could actually look closely at, it, it's really, really quite, quite good. Below is a photograph, the first photograph of the Orion Nebula by the American astronomer Henry Draper from his observatory on Hastings on Hudson. So you sort of get a sense of the Orion Nebula, but without a doubt, anybody comparing the drawing to Draper's photograph would say, I'll take the drawing. <laughs> okay, Draper's, I believe, is a 50 minute exposure. Uh, compare it though to comments and you see this is when astronomers started to wake up to the idea that oh maybe there is something some research possibility to this camera business this photography Andrew Common wrote an article then in 1884 about how to build, use telescopes for astronomical photography, a very informative how-to kind of uh, article for those who wish to tackle astronomical photography. And he wrote, photography has now shown itself to be capable of giving us pictures of nebulae that are far superior to those made by eye and hand. And he pointed out, and other astronomers agreed, that the camera could show stars that did not appear to the eye through a telescope. That was very significant. And Common went on to envision the future for astronomical photography. A library may now be made of pictures written on leaves of glass by the stars themselves. That was a common way to refer to astronomical, well, just photography in general, that nature itself is creating these pictures. And he was right. Well, what did Andrew Common say after he used his 37 inch telescope for a brief time, I need a bigger telescope. 
So he embarked on his own personal project to make a telescope uh, 60 inches in aperture. Uh, he was ultimately unsuccessful. He, he created the disc. He did grind the glass, uh, but the telescope was never mounted correctly and never really worked. And by the 1890s, so we're just talking about, you know, about a decade later, some years into this big project, Andrew Common said, that's it, I'm out. I'm going to go work for the Navy on gun sites. So he left astronomy and he sold his telescope already in 1885. It's just two years after he took that groundbreaking telescope <clears throat> uh, to a wealthy person, Edward Crossley, who lived in Yorkshire, England. And Crossley had the wherewithal to build an actual observatory for this thing, this telescope. So the common telescope became the Crossley telescope. And that is, that is it. You can see it here. And oh, there's a guy up there, someone standing right up there. So this diagram shows you the layout of Crossley's observatory. And I have this arrow here marked off 20 feet. Okay, this little circle, that's the eyepiece, or that's where the camera goes. And so there was this rotatable ladder. It was attached to the inside of the dome so that the observer would have to climb up here to gain access to the eyepiece at night in the dark. You're up there some 20 feet or so above the ground. Uh, it turns out Common did fall once. Fortunately, he was not hurt, but maybe that was about the time he uh, got interested in getting rid of this this telescope. So you see, uh, you may recognize the whole setup from the picture that I showed uh, earlier. Okay, the Victorians loved to build in iron. And so this dome was iron ribbed and iron plated. You could shoot a cannonball at it and it would just bounce off and it weighed 15 tons. Added to the nine tons of the telescope, we're talking about a very, very heavyweight piece of apparatus here. <clears throat> Crossley, he never really got directly involved with this telescope. He actually hired an observer to look through the telescope, take pictures with the telescope and such. And the observer, I recall reading some of the person's notes, just lamented the fact that th such a telescope was in Yorkshire with all the fog and the cloud. And he speculated, this thing really belongs on top of a mountain somewhere. <clears throat> and so, we moved to Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton in California, where many of you, I believe, are in the, <clears throat> that part of the, the world. So in the 1890s, you see there was Lick Observatory, the famous 36-inch Lick Refractor Telescope from 1888 or 7, I believe. <clears throat> so this is a very famous observatory. <clears throat> which was led at the time by, this is, we're now into the 1890s, by Edward S. Holden. Uh, he was not beloved by the staff there. Uh, his various nicknames were the dictator, Prince Holden, 
that contemptible brute rarely, I assume, said to his face. But wouldn't you know it, that wish by that observer that the Crossley telescope would wind up on a mountaintop somewhere. There it is. Okay, the Crossley, formerly the Common Telescope, this 37 inch instrument was emplaced, it was donated and emplaced intact on the top of Mount Hamilton. <clears throat> So what do the astronomers think of this thing? So here is the picture that I showed before. And you can notice now, here's this ladder, which goes around with the turning of the dome, because again, you have to get up to use the Newtonian focus here. <clears throat> so what do they think? Well, the famous astronomer Edward Emerson Barnard said, it's no good old junk. And he added that he wouldn't pay more than $5 for it. Another astronomer called it a monstrosity. Someone said it's as antiquated as Noah's Ark. And someone else came up with the idea. Since the eyepiece is so high up, the dome should be filled with water so astronomers can observe from a boat. This was not a beloved instrument. <clears throat> Holden tasked one of the staff astronomers with the use of this telescope, somehow wrangle it into something that was useful because Andrew Common showed that with patience, you can take some really good photographs through this thing, but there was nobody on the staff who had the time or patience. The person who was assigned, in fact, left after dealing with this scope for just a little while. <clears throat> after Holden was basically driven out, as the director, James Keeler came on board in 1898. Keeler represented uh, sort of a, a, a new style astronomer, somebody who was highly, highly educated, not just in astronomy, but in what was only then becoming known as astrophysics or astral physics or the physics of astronomy. So he trained at Johns Hopkins, then went over to Europe where that's where all of his equally famous colleagues decided they really had to train European observatories. Then he went to Berlin. And by the time he came back, he was one of the highest trained astrophysical astronomers in the entire country. And he decided rather than impose the Crosley telescope on anyone else that he would take it as his baby. He was gonna get this thing in order, which he did. So he wrote an entire article that was printed in the Astrophysical Journal, which was a fairly new journal back in those days that described in detail everything that he did to this telescope. Nothing really to the mirror, which was fine, but the mounting, he really reworked that tremendously and was able to wrangle it into submission. Meaning that here in 1898, with this telescope that all the other staff members were ridiculing, Keeler was able himself to take a 40 minute exposure, again, in several minute chunks of the Orion Nebula, which is in every way, well, better than any telescope had imaged it before. <clears throat> Certainly better than Andrew Common's photograph previously. Okay, just to compare the two, 
they both show the filamentary nature of the nebula. But if you look closely at the details, there is so much more in the 1898 Keeler photograph with the same telescopes. Emotion, photographic emulsions had also improved. But this was a picture taken from atop a mountain as opposed to this picture taken from London. <clears throat> so this picture was very, very striking to all astronomers. And once again, it showed stars that were fainter that, than what could be picked up just by eye at the eyepiece. This is cheating. This is, I'm fast forwarding to 1928. I just want to show you what could be achieved again with that same telescope with a new mount, but the same mirror in there <clears throat> uh, of the Orion Nebula. Just an extraordinary picture taken with a like one meter telescope. Pretty good for 1928. So Keeler went on. He spent a lot of time with this telescope because he understood what this telescope represented. Finally, somebody had placed a large, relatively short focal length, that is wide field reflector telescope up above the haze, up on top of a mountain. And he wanted to show what the capability of not just the Crossley reflector was, but any such reflector. <clears throat> so here you see, again, M51. Okay, the, again, the Crossley is, it had a one degree wide field, so it didn't really zoom in on things like, like the Hubble Space Telescope can, but uh, this was a four hour exposure. You can just, Imagine what Keeler had to deal with during those four hours to create such an, an extraordinarily <laughs> photograph. Here's an edge on spiral galaxy. <clears throat> well, I should use the word nebula. These were still in the 1890s called spiral nebulae. Lord Ross in the 1840s discovered these spiral nebulae, these cloud-like swirly um, ob celestial objects, and they found a few more of them as the, that uh, century wore on, but they didn't know what they were. They knew these were nebulae, which just means they appear cloudy. It was not clear whether the light that coming from this was from stars or from gas. So it's, it was not clear whether this was like an Orion Nebula with a spiral shape or whether it was some kind of star system like our Milky Way galaxy. <clears throat> that had not been determined. So these are spiral nebulae. Another one seen edge on. Three hour exposure. Here's the Trifid Nebula, just to show you another nebula. Of course, black and white film in those days, another three hour exposure. Okay, M13 star cluster, not bad for two hour exposure in the year 1900, pretty cool. Uh, so there are, I think something like a hundred or so of these photographs in an atlas from that time. These are sort of the greatest hits. So here we have again, uh, Edward Emerson Barnard, who said he wouldn't pay $5 for that telescope. 
admitting that these very beautiful nebular photographs are really the finest that have ever been made. And if you know anything about Barnard and, and his relationship to celestial photography, you know that he was really, really impressed. And this statement means a lot. But the important discovery of the time was not what I just showed you. It's what we couldn't see in these photographs. What you can only see if you had the glass plate or print in front of you with a little magnifier and look close at the, the dark areas around this targeted object. Keeler wrote in 1900 in the Astrophysical Journal something that really changed the thinking of astronomy and the arc of astronomy. Besides showing these beautiful pictures, he said, many thousands of unrecorded nebulae exist in the sky. A conservative estimate places the number within reach of the Crossley reflector, one meter reflector at about 120,000. Later, that number was up to probably more, more, more than a million or a couple of million. And then the most important sentence, most of these nebulae have a spiral structure. So whereas before the Crossley telescope did its work, Spiral nebulae were rather small in number and just considered to be some like oddity in the, in the celestial zoo. Keeler with this telescope and the camera was able to show that these spiral nebulae are a major component of all of the celestial objects in the universe. We astronomers better pay due attention to what these things are because they're so, so numerous. <clears throat> Sadly, Keeler, as you see here, died of a stroke in 1900 at the age of 42. So he was not able to continue with this work, but uh, the work was followed up by other astronomers, including uh, Perrine, who took pictures into the, well, he took that 1928 photo that I showed you. <clears throat> so what is the legacy of this telescope, this best worst telescope that everybody complained about? Well, it for the first time demonstrated the value of large mountaintop reflector telescopes. We don't hear about it. We hear about you know the 60 inch and the 100 inch and the 200 inch. This was sort of the, 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 the Ur big telescope. It was like the, the first one. It validated photography as an essential tool of astronomical discovery. Finding out that a particular kind of celestial object was so ubiquitous was just amazing. And improving the ubiquity of these spiral nebulae in literally every photograph that Keeler took, he pointed out these little wisps of light that are these spiral nebulae. It was proved, well, within just a little over 20 years in the early 1920s that these nebulae, which had been suspected as being external galaxies really are external galaxies. So the whole picture, astronomical picture of the, the construction of the universe, how things were arranged, altered from a single Milky Way with empty space to multiple, multiple galaxies strewn as far as telescopes even today have been able to detect.
So I would say that this picture, the 100 inch, is a direct legacy of this demonstration. Okay, so I, I'm sure that Hale was very aware of what Keeler did on Mount Hamilton in the observatory. And this image of a galaxy strewn field is likewise, if you really take it back, likewise, uh, at least the path toward that understanding, one can argue began with that best worst telescope. So I can stop there. I will stop my share and I will hopefully be able to answer any questions that anyone might have. <clears throat> I have a comment and a question. I'll get started. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm Curtis. I'm one of the uh, regular docents at uh, Palomar Observatory. Uh, during happier times, I have given many tours. Uh, two of our other docents gave me a copy of your Starlight Detectives for my 70th birthday. And uh, this is back in 2014, sorry, which says how old I am. But uh, uh, I loved it. I read the whole thing cover to cover and I loved it. And I incorporated uh, some of the ideas from this book into my tours. Now, my, our, our tours are limited to one hour, so I can't cover the entire book, of course. But uh, there were parts of it, this transition from, uh, of astronomy from an amateur-based pursuit to uh, you know professional astrophysics in the uh, 1880s and 1890s is a, because uh, I'm talking about George Ellery Hale, of course, this is a, uh, I've included this as part of my tours. So I just want to say, I love your book. It's sitting on the shelf behind me and uh, it's been a major asset to my tour giving at Palomar Observatory. Well, thank uh, you for that. Okay, the, uh, uh, the Crossley reflector, it still exists, does it not? It does, yes. Uh, um, so it, it has been, well, let's just say the mount has been reworked so that as of today, as far as I know, and I haven't been out there, but I think that the mirror is one of the two original mirrors. Oh. Calver made two of them because while one is being re-silvered, uh, Common was able to use the other. Um, I know that one of the two mirrors cracked. Uh, they were gonna, they were desperate to get away from the, the Newtonian style of the telescope. So they tried to drill a central hole to turn it into a Cassegrain and the, the mirror cracked. So the, the mirror that is currently in the Crossley, I believe, and I haven't read anything to the contrary, is from 1879. So that said, the, that telescope, the last that it was officially used for research was back in 2009. <clears throat> So it's, yeah, it's, I guess offline, it might still be used. I wasn't able to find out if, uh, if somebody asked, could they go and use the thing? Uh, it, it is still rather clunky to use and needs training before somebody is able to use it. So it may be that <clears throat> at Lick, they just don't have anybody to allocate to training people. Okay, well, uh, uh, I guess you've answered my question, which was, uh, is there any remaining part of the original telescope? So according to you, the, uh, the mirror is in fact, probably uh, one of the original mirrors. Yeah, there was an article in some 1960s Sky and Telescope about all the changes, upgrades that were made to this telescope. And they mentioned only the mount, the original mount has been 
scrapped because that's where it basically belongs. Uh, but I never read anything about replacing the mirror, which I, I don't see why there would be any need to really replace such a thing. Um, I've spoken with uh, John Briggs, who is very big in the like uh, vintage astronomy world, antiquarian instruments. And uh, he didn't know. He said that he would go look at the mirror. Evidently, there's something about the coloration of the glass that would indicate whether it's from back in the 1800s versus something newer. So I, I suspect that, uh, I think it is still one of those early mirrors. There's a comment in the chat about the current status. Ah, okay, let me open up my chat here. Off limits for safety reasons. That would be a, <clears throat> a, a very good reason. <clears throat> Yeah, um, let's see, I'm, I'm just gonna, oh wait, I think if I can just share once again. Ah, here we go. So here you see the evolution of this Crossley telescope. So this is already by 1905 when Perrine was using it. And you can see already the whole mounting, the tube all replaced. So essentially, even then it was just the, the mirror that was left. And 1962, they gave it a good paint job. And, uh, but yes, for safety reasons, look at this gallery up here. The astronomer is up at the still Newtonian focus. And at night, this is a pretty long, long way down. Well, I also, I also read someplace that uh, Crossley himself was quite offended that the people at uh, Lick Observatory had uh, replaced the mounting of his telescope because he thought when he turned it over to University of California that it was a perfect instrument and they didn't think so. And he was highly <laughs> offended by that. Yes, yeah, I, I believe that's true. Yep. And I think he, wanted, he, he also wanted money for it. And they didn't want to pay anything for it. So. In, your, in your description of that, uh, Andrew Common's uh, contribution to the telescope, it's, it's you suggested that he uh, is the originator of the uh, plate holder with the adjusting screws on it, or had that been used before? Was that his invention? Uh, it was not his invention. Um, I'm, I, I believe Henry Draper, well, Henry Draper was doing photography certainly before, uh, time exposure photography before Common. And I would assume that he had some sort of plate holder, but that, and it's, it's a good question. I don't know the answer whether this plate holder was developed with these uh, like adjustment screws. Um, I, I would imagine it had already been done because there was no highly accurate telescope for photography. There just was no tracking system that was accurate enough. Can you say anything about major phases or milestones in glass plate emulsions? Um, I know that by the time they were doing the Palomar uh, Sky Survey, they were hypering the emulsion in that special little building we call the Hindenburg. And I'm old enough, but didn't get into the hobby soon enough to have been used those hypering chambers for photographic film. Yeah, so I only know what took place during the 1800s that originally uh, they were photographing with a daguerreotype, uh, which was almost impervious 
to light. So it was extremely difficult to take any photographs using a daguerreotype setup. Uh, around 1851, I think it was, at Harvard, they took a, a quite impressive picture of the, the half moon and displayed that at the Paris uh, ex, London Exposition uh, that year. Uh, after the daguerreotype, there was wet plate collodion photography. So you had to mix the emulsion, put it onto a glass plate, and you had to expose it before it dried out, which typically limited the exposures to about 15 minutes or so. And it was with the invention of <clears throat> the, the dry, so-called dry plate in the late, it was about late 1860, and then 1870s, in the 1870s, that astronomy really took off because there were essentially no chemical, almost no chemical limits to the exposure time. It was dictated mostly by the mechanics of, of the telescope. And then after that, um, there were incremental improvements. Somebody may know more than I do about uh, 20th century improvements of emulsions, but these are like the big transitory stages that uh, boosted astronomy by the end of the 1800s. Oh, thank you. Alan, I was fascinated by your very first slide with all the people who were involved. Could you share that slide and perhaps identify the various characters uh, who, are, who are in it? Sure. It's the history of astronomy there that you had on that slide. Yeah, I mean, if I were doing this not virtually, yeah, I would uh, leave it up there for a while and see how many people can identify. Yeah. Astronomers are getting there. Uh, whoop. yeah. Whoops. Okay, there we go. Well, you have Louis Daguerre up in the upper left. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, Foucault? Maybe third from the right, left. That's, um, and, uh, right. Annie. Ah. Whoops. Well. Ah, there we go. And that uh, Annie Jump Cannon, I think. Uh, yes. Mm. So. Let's see. And of course, there's that, Hale and Hubble there. Yeah, so here is John Draper. Oh, okay. Annie Cannon. This is uh, William Bond, who was oh. the first director of the Harvard Observatory. Milton Humason, who you know from Palomar. Um, Isaac, uh, Isaac Roberts, okay, we know him, that's Hale, and Hubble, and um, Huggins, Mrs. Huggins, uh, whoop, ah. I believe could be Henry Fitz, Barnard. Uh, well, my senior moments are piling up. Okay, and this is uh, also Harvard, I believe, uh, Pickering. Pickering, okay. yeah. Yeah. The previous one was Adams. Ah, uh, yes, Adams, right, right. Uh, and uh, Rutherford from New York City. They okay, had a telescope and observatory in New York City. Henry Draper. Uh, this is William. 
um, Dawes, I believe. Uh, Huggins, Mr. Huggins. This is um, Fleming. And that is Keeler. Well, for a senior moment, that's uh, quite <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Remember all that. <laughs> I have it all written down, but I, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, as uh, Arago, I'm just going to see anyone I missed. I'll just go back. Uh, yeah. yeah, it did pretty well. Oh, John Adams Whipple. Okay, Whipple and Arago. I also read Starlight Detectives. Ah, oh, here I see the name. This is Francois Arago who was instrumental in promoting uh, photography, the daguerreotype. And let's see, this, this is John Adams Whipple, who was a Boston daguerreotypist who marched up to the Harvard College Observatory and insisted that he wanted to help out taking pictures through the telescope. And uh, he, he actually did that. He worked with this fellow here, William Bond. So the two of them uh, took some early photos through Harvard's, I believe it's a, a 12 inch refractor. And I think all the others I got right. Yeah, William Fitz, a telescope maker in New York City made telescopes for Rutherford down here, who observed from New York City. Henry Draper, okay, so he um, generated that first rather crude image of the, Orion, of the Orion Nebula. And yeah, Huggins, they worked as a team to advance Celestial spectroscopy. And that's Williamina Fleming, who was on the staff at Harvard Observatory. So um, I have a comment and a question. I also, uh, I listened to the book on Audible and found it just absolutely fascinating. Um, my comment is you had a section about at Lick where I want to say the director and one of the like faculty members were fighting so much they passed each other handwritten notes <laughs> and it just it killed me I actually work at UCLA for the use in the UC system and yeah. like yeah. that story just I went to like I heard that on my way to work one day and like in the office went and told everybody I'm like oh you got how funny is this? Like, it's so faculty member to me, like that they, yeah. and I'm sure the penmanship was beautiful. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like it just, yes, yeah, yeah. It, it, it evokes so much for me. Um, but yeah, one question. People, people are people are people, you know, I, I'm sure you have the same thing that happened a hundred years before that even, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what I was curious about is you you reference a lot of images throughout the book. Did you ever like compile something for the reader? Because like I looked on the Audible and there wasn't like a attached PDF or anything. So I had to just kind of Google as you mentioned things. And, you know, it's funny, you we talk about that, that first Orion Nebula image as being not all that impressive. My first mm -hmm. Orion Nebula image wasn't much better. I mean, it was in color, but yeah. you know, I think that's just part of it. And for me, like, I, I love that. Like, it it makes it extra special for me. Like, I love the journey. Yeah, that's interesting. I I never realized. Yeah, if you're listening to the book, you're not seeing 
all the pictures. So the pictures the, are in the printed book? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. And I mean, it makes me think maybe I should post these at my website. I, it, it never occurred to me that somebody would not have the, the pictures available. Yes, yeah, so on, on Audible, sometimes they will do, like the, the publishing company or something can make a PDF available so that you can see, you know, the accompanying images. But hmm. that's why I thought there wasn't even images. But um, I mean, oh, yeah, personally, no, no, no. I would love to see them. Okay, well, I have my summer project then. Uh, to add these to my, my website. I think that's probably the best way to make them available. I have them all on my computer. Uh, all right, so I will set out to do that and hopefully I'll be able to accomplish that uh, maybe first part of the summer or so. That would be amazing, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, if I could speak, I, would, I really like the book I was very impressed with chapter 15, sort of it's um, Bunsen and Kirchhoff and their, their discovery. This, you know, they were you know, a couple of workaholics, it seemed like, working late at night. And I wonder if you could tell that story. I mean, it's, sort of, it's so essential to celestial spectroscopy. I, I love these guys. <laughs> I mean, Bunsen and Kirchhoff, you know, the, this very odd pairing of a physicist and a chemist both of whom sort of filled in the knowledge that was lacking from the other. They were an extraordinary team. Together, they were like a single genius, practically. Uh, so by the 1850s, um, well, I can't tell the whole story, but uh, so, Bunsen was older than Kirchhoff. Bunsen became world famous as a chemist uh, before Kirchhoff was even widely known. But Bunsen had observed Kirchhoff's teaching some years before and decided, I want this guy to come to the University of Heidelberg so I can work with him. Uh, and it turns out uh, just a few years later, the opportunity arose and <clears throat> Kirchhoff uh, joined Bunsen's work. What Bunsen was trying to do was to identify chemical elements by the color of their glow when they were combusted, okay, his Bunsen burner was constructed for that reason. He would put samples of different purified elements into the flame. And he tried to come up with some system whereby the overall color perceived by the eye would tell you what chemical element you're dealing with. That turned out to be unsuccessful despite the hard work what Kirchhoff brought to the table was, uh, hey, uh, Wilhelm, you know, there's this thing called spectroscopy that we physicists have been fooling around with now for some decades. Why don't you try taking the light from the burning substance and passing it through a spectroscope? Maybe the spectroscopic pattern, the, the, the pattern of colors, basically, maybe that will be a way to identify chemical elements. So just to make that story uh, shorter, that turned out to be the case, that they convinced themselves with about a, a year of intensive study, comparing the spectra of chemical elements to each other in the laboratory, and then comparing the spacing of the spectral lines. Um, if I'm sort of getting away from people here, you'll, you'll just have to read it in the book. So each chemical element had a unique pattern of spectral lines, lines of color. 
which they proved matched the patterns in the sun's spectrum. So in 1859, there were two amazing scientific uh, transitions. One was the introduction of Darwin's origin of the species, and the other was Kirchhoff and Bunsen's uh, paper on how we can tell the chemical constituents of the sun and the stars by their light. So that's, so neither that, one alone would have been able to do this. So it's very interesting in history, there have sometimes been some pairs who really boosted uh, each other's productivity. So there's a legacy of uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff uh, which takes place at Palomar Observatory later on, where Martin Schmidt uses the spectral lines of these bright distant objects to identify quasars. Yes. Uh, that's sort of a direct legacy of, of what Bunsen and Kirchhoff did. Yeah, you know, and it's also an interesting example of I don't know if you'd call it quite serendipity. People have been looking at these spectra of these quasars and sort of throwing up their hands. We don't, we don't understand these unfamiliar patterns. And somehow Martin Schmidt recognized that, oh, wait a second, this is the regular pattern of spectral lines, but shifted way, way over toward the red with lines that normally would be in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum shifted into the visible portion of the spectrum. So that realization, uh, that's, yeah, it, it's a remarkable thing when it happens. Same kind of thing with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background by Penzias and Wilson. They had this remnant signal that they could not explain as a radio wave signal coming in from outer space. Um, and they spent months and months trying to track down the source of the signal. And <clears throat> They could have given up because it was a very, very small, small signal, but they didn't. They persevered. And then uh, Dickey, who a cosmologist at Princeton, when Arno Penzias called him up and said, what do you think this is? Dickey said, oh, I, I was just building a receiver to try and find what you just found. It's the the cosmic microwave background. It's sort of the leftover energy from the Big Bang. So it's, it's sort of neat when a lot of people are looking at the same thing and then all of a sudden, uh, Einstein, <laughs> they see it in a different light. Well, if I could, we, we, are, we are running, we're running a bit long and I'd like to spend couple of minutes talking about your most recent book, Introduction to Stars and Planets. And Dr. Hirschfeld, would you tell us about the concept, about the structure? What, what's the audience for this book? How, how did you put it together? You know, kind of give us an overview of it, please. Sure. Um, as a longtime teacher of college astronomy, uh, mm -hmm. of course, I mean, as you can tell, I get excited about astronomy as we all do, but conveying that excitement to a student audience uh, is, is challenging. Many of them are taking an astronomy class to fulfill a science requirement. And so now many years ago, I decided that th there's no number of pretty pictures. There's no level of excitement that I can 
show to the students that will basically make them learn what astronomers do and how marvelous all these discoveries are. So I, for my one astronomy course on the history of uh, our conception of the universe, I look back at the various observations, discoveries that were made by astronomers and uh, found some that I could tailor to a college liberal arts audience. So I would spend the class time telling them a little bit of background, but then they would have to go and actually do something in this book that I uh, published. <clears throat> it could be measuring the height on a height of a lunar mountain using a sketch by Galileo or um, figuring out Hubble's law using actual observations that I, I give them. Uh, so in, in essence, the students, at least in a symbolic sense, well, they're doing something which is certainly important in any class, but they're doing what astronomers nominally do. Or are they getting a sense of what it is that astronomers do? So with that approach, in my other astronomy class, which was about stars and planets, uh, I, I basically thought, well, how did I, what did I learn about stars and planets? And I came up with a series of almost 30 uh, sort of paper and pencil, slightly mathematical uh, exercises that the students can do in the classroom that will show them how it is that astronomers know what they know. How do they know how heavy the sun is? How do they know how big it is, how far away it is? How do they know what the sun is made of? These are all things that I don't want to tell them. I want them to demonstrate to themselves. So that's sort of the, the genesis of, of that book. I, I have to apologize that uh, I had no idea what the publisher was going to charge for this book. <laughs> it has a, a ridiculous price of $95 um, because the publisher thinks it's some kind of college textbook <clears throat> and we can take advantage of the college uh, students. Uh, I am trying to convince the publisher to lower the price to something that reasonably is affordable, but as of now, uh, the book is unfortunately very, very expensive. Well, the book, the book is is directed. At, at a classroom setting, if, if I'm classroom setting and individuals working through um, the various various cases that you yeah. that you set up, um, you know, Curtis Curtis a little while ago talked about what we do here in talking to the public. We have about an hour at a time. Uh, try to explain some of the science that goes on here. Um, it may be something of an odd question, but do you have any thoughts about how, how this book might help us in what we do in talking to the public? <clears throat> yeah, the, the longer I've been teaching, the, the more I've learn to sort of minimize my own uh, telling of the tale. Uh, I, I believe that to, to best get across uh, concepts in any science, 
there's got to be something active. The, the, the person has to work on a, a problem, has to solve some mystery or, or something. So, you know, uh, short of having the visitors work through some kind of simplified problem, um, it, it would probably have to be somewhat simpler than what's presented, you know, in, in my book. Um, but the more that you can get the audience to d do their own work, you know, uh, the better. Oh. The thing is, you know, when you have visitors, they're there voluntarily. And so yeah, they're, they're eager to learn. They're eager to listen to you. Uh, what I have found is you know, in, a, in a college class, if you're teaching, say, a science course that is a, a requirement to be fulfilled by an English or visual design major, they might not be, in general, they won't be as motivated to, to learn new things until the, the stakes are higher, like a test comes up or, or so. <laughs> So that's why I, I essentially force my students to do work in the classroom and to work together in teams because it's more fun that way. I have two comments picking up on this, Steve. Uh, actually, one is I noticed that we have at least two and maybe more feline attendees on this Zoom call. <laughs> And you know who they are, you people who are, who are their friends. Uh, but my favorite exhibit, uh, picking up on, on what uh, Alan Hirschfield said, my favorite exhibit in the Greenway Museum at the observatory is that spectroscopy uh, hmm. exhibit, which actually shows people how the light from these different elements is broken up. And my one of my experiences is that I often see the kids who visit looking at this, they look at it, and then once they, once one of the docents who are there, uh, I know um, a lot of us like hanging out in, in the museum, um, once one of us explain to them what's going on there, then the kids are bringing over their parents or their mm -hmm. grandparents or their friends, whoever they came with, and showing them how the spectroscopy works. And uh, I'm sure that those kind of exhibits are expensive, uh, but maybe we could talk, or maybe we could look at um, Alan's book and see if there are other things that we might, there are companies that make these kinds of exhibits for science courses. Maybe we could find out if some of these other sort of participatory um, displays are might be available to us. Well, I actually have a, a practical idea that I have used successfully at our uh, campus observatory open houses, and uh, in my classes, when we get to the topic of spectroscopy. And you know, you can buy for very little money these like two by two little diff plastic diffraction gratings. Yeah. You, you can buy them by the, the hundreds, you won't break the bank. Uh, and so what I do is I have uh, an electric discharge tube, well, basically a fluorescent tube you can buy from a science supply house with various gases in each one. Yeah. And you buy s some you know, high voltage source that you install these in. You turn it on, you ask the students to just look through their diffraction grading slides and they see like floating in the air this virtual reality world of colored lines. Um, so it's a reality that is only given to the human eye when you have a device that you augment the eye with. And they're very easily shown that different chemical elements have different patterns of lines. Uh, <clears throat> 
so I do this, yeah, especially at night out at the observatory. I'll set up a card table with uh, one of these gas discharge tubes and have people look at the spectrum of hydrogen and helium. And, and they love it. I mean, the kids are really excited to see some aspect of the world that's not normally visible to them. You know, there are various kinds of, uh, I don't know, Pokemon games or something where you can look through your cell phone and you see little creatures superimposed you know, in the real world. It's sort of along those lines. Uh, something that's there, it's ever present. And with a little two by two slide, it just opens up uh, a, a world that they're not used to, to seeing. So that I can definitely recommend. Yeah, I, wonder that's if, exactly. uh, I wonder if the uh, little uh, two by two slides um, would work on our display system uh, in the in the museum, um, I think I'm going to buy a package of 25 of those. Uh, I better consult with Steve and, and the powers that be at the observatory if and when we ever open up to the public again. Uh, but this might be a, something that we might give away uh, to the kids. I think if you know if you buy them, uh, they're under two bucks. I I know yeah. that and. Uh, you know, I'd certainly be happy to make a some sort of a, a gift to the uh, uh, outreach program for that. But Steve, you'll have to tell me what the well, whatever the procedures might be for that. Yeah, we'll 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 have to do that off offline. <laughs> yes, okay. I'm afraid I'm going to get rebuked now. <laughs> well, that's that's what we do at Mount Wilson when we have our. We have students, uh, high school, elementary school students come up and do some lessons and we give them and we, we let them take them home. Uh, the the uh, grading glasses that you have to tell them, don't look at the sun. And then they get all their friends. Hey, you look at the sun because that's the way they do. <laughs> but um, and then we light up the little lamps and we have them pick. We show them some things. Okay, pick which one of these looks like the one you saw and, and go through the spectrum and show the periodic table of the spectrum. And it's, it is a really good interactive thing. We, we do that regularly and did it just last Monday for our first group of the year. We had some fifth and sixth grade students come up and they loved it. They, and they like to be able to take those glasses home. So if you can afford it and you can give them away. That's a great thing to do. And I was wondering, because I have not seen your new book, <clears throat> are the exercises in, in the book really directed to college students? Are they things that you think somebody younger, maybe in high school or whatever, could do if they were associated with a, a lesson like that? Yeah, uh, they are what I call mildly mathematical. Uh, I simplify the formulas whenever possible. Uh, so basically a person just has to be comfortable using a, a calculator and plugging in numbers. Uh, each activity is broken down into a lot of discrete steps. So my... Well, I've, I've been working on this in the classroom now for five years. I've had students who are non-science majors. I had honors students and physics majors. And uh, there have been very, very few complaints that oh, I can't do this. It involves arithmetic calculation. So for... <laughs> The main goal of the book, of course, I wanted students to, to do something in astronomy, and I wanted them to understand how it is that astronomers who are not privileged to leave the planet can figure out all that they know about 
the universe, the galaxies, well, this will be stars and exoplanets now. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not at the telescope, obviously, making the observations, but I'm trying to put, uh, give them the data, give them the data, tell them where the data came from so they can, on their own, figure out what the evolution of the sun is. Or um, we talk about binary stars, and I give an example, you know, they have to figure out the mass of the binary system. But then I realize, oh, those black holes that are sending out gravity waves, you can figure out the masses of those things too. So it's a condensation of everything that I learned you know, during my college days as an astronomy person, simplified. <clears throat> And then, yeah, presented for uh, a more general audience. So I've had one high school student work through these without any trouble at all. And I have another one who's going to be doing them this coming summer. So, yeah, it is something that is accessible to a wide range of people who might be interested in the subject. Again, you know, I, I wish this, I had no idea when I signed on, it, it's published by the American Astronomical Society that it was gonna be priced the way that it is. Um, I, I'm working at it. Uh, I don't expect sales to be all that great you know, outside of colleges. Well, can I, you know, go back back to that that question I asked about the book's relevance to what we do as docents here, talking to the public, and um, I guess where that comes from is I I have a hope, I have an expectation, I think, that <clears throat> personally, as I work through some of these things. Um, I will be better at explaining some of the science to the people who come up here and who have very, I have very short periods of time to explain it. Um, I hope I'll be better at that, some of these issues. Uh, but I, I do need to ask, um, in, in the preface to the book, you write that, um, Applying quantitative methods to a series of well-defined tasks and achieving the right answer, exclamation point, <clears throat> eases math anxiety. Well, <clears throat> I got to admit, as a history major, I got tangled up with a couple of points, particularly <laughs> the last two sections on, um, on exoplanets. Mm. Are the answers anywhere? <clears throat> well, uh, I'll come uh, down and work on them with you, Steve. <laughs> oh, Tim, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. I need it. <laughs> you know, I asked, again, I asked the publisher, do, will you have a website where I can you know, put answers for uh, instructors people who have bought the book and they don't provide that service. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, I, I can certainly send you uh, like a copy of the answers to those two activities. I'm not quite sure what to do in terms of posting them. If students are working through them and they find out that all the answers are available on the web, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So it's got to be behind some kind of uh, access point. Uh, so for now, I'm the access point. You, you can ask me, you know, for anything about about the book. 
I have a suggestion that the publisher might like. There was a period of my life where I was teaching physics at various places, and we used uh, a physics textbook, uh, kind of famous, I think, Halliday and Resnick. Sure. And the uh, publisher published this little paperback book. Halliday and Resnick was a hardbound book, it's like mm -hmm. two volumes. And this was the answers to all the even number problems. And I found that the students loved this book. <laughs> they loved this book. Everybody who bought the hardcover, I don't know, I, I didn't do a scientific survey, yeah. but they also bought this little paperback version. And, you know, the publisher, uh, I don't know who the pub Wiley, I guess, was the publisher. Um, they made money from this. The students liked it. And um, I don't know how you influence a publisher to make the cost affordable, but this is a, you know, is your, your book, uh, Alan, I'm assuming is a a hardbound book? Uh, it is an ebook, or you can get an actual paper copy. Oh, it's but so, so it's not yeah, a hardbound book even. Well, I was thinking this might be cheaper for the publisher to make, and they could sell it for less with the answers. Well, who knows? I don't know the publishing business at all. Yeah, yeah. This it's a a joint program between the American Astronomical Society and the Institute of Physics in the UK, uh, they got together to publish more books in astronomy. Uh, and many of these books are highly, highly technical, uh, of interest only you know, to specialists, but there are a few that are more oriented towards students in astronomy education. So uh, Andy Fracknoy and I have been trying to get them to lower the price of those education related books. Um, but I haven't heard back uh, whether anything is happening <laughs> on that score. Well, so, Professor, uh, Professor Hirschfeld, you've been very generous with your time this morning. And I think I think we probably need to bring bring the meeting down to a conclusion. I thank you very much. Um, I think this was a wonderful discussion, both of the uh, you know the 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 introduction to stars and planets, the the teaching the teaching the instruction part of that book. And, and I appreciate you spending the time on it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really wonderful. Everybody clap. Okay. <laughs> That's it. And with that, um, I guess, let me conclude with a few words about our next speaker. In two weeks, May 22nd, graduate student, Cecilia Sanders, a PhD candidate in Caltech's Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences, will give a talk titled, You'll Know It When You See It, Defining, Describing, and Detecting Life in the Universe. Again, thank you, Professor, Professor Hirschfeld, and thank you for everybody for attending and supporting the Greenway Talks and coming here every two weeks. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And with that, I think it's time we close the meeting and I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody. Everybody wave. <laughs> yep. Bye-bye. Thank you again. So long. Bye-bye.